Just to put the uh, situation a little bit, uh, I'm even going a little bit more uh, diffuse. It's not just radiotherapy for head and neck. I'm just going to talk about head and neck cancer management in general. Things that I think we need to know as radiation medicine specialists looking after these patients uh, that might not necessarily be touched on in the remainder of the talks. I've tried to guess a little bit about what other people are speaking about uh, and uh, hopefully I hit the right notes as we, we go through it. So um, to, to kick off, I, I'll just uh, uh, <clears throat> mention this particular overview paper from Lancet Oncology that um, I had the good fortune to write with uh, Vincent Gregoire and some of our other colleagues going through uh, a lot of the different advances in head and neck radiotherapy at present and, on, and going on into the, the future as well in terms of the, the concepts that we would like to think we can uh, address uh, efficiently in the, in the years to come, particularly adaptive radiotherapy and tailoring our treatments based on having uh, imaging and other concepts that will bring biology into the target delineation. Uh, we do recognize that there are many different aspects of biology that are becoming more and more apparent and are being more and more important in terms of understanding the behavior of different diseases and will uh, and are already beginning to uh, individualize the types of treatment, at least for groups of patients, uh, recognizing a theme that will come out uh, as we go through the talk that not all, uh, not all ca cancers of the head and neck now are the same. They, uh, they, they are differentiating features for a variety of reasons that we will touch on. Uh, so, as a very broad statement, surgery and radiotherapy are, are the two most important tools for head and neck cancer control. Uh, radiotherapy is very effective for treating uh, the primary site to achieve organ and functional preservation. And in some diseases, for example, nasopharynx is the only treatment option in the primary modality. It enhances also surgical option when given uh, as an adjuvant, whether it be pre or postoperatively and is often combined with chemotherapy, which I will touch on momentarily, but the combination of the two, of course, is quite toxic, and one needs to be careful about who is given that treatment. I noticed I was at a meeting over the weekend, and it seemed to be easier to design the trial by giving everybody chemotherapy as a post-operative management with radiotherapy and defying the normal principles of management that we would usually use in terms of selecting patients for chemotherapy, and many of us had we're at a lot of discomfort with that, where some people seem to feel that was fine. And I think one has to be very careful. This is a toxic treatment when you combine the two together. You need to have a good reason for doing it. The new paradigm is that one size does not fit all. Different patients have different behavioral characteristics, different situations, and the current milieu and management is towards uh, having more structured uh, protocols that will look at uh, different outcomes and different needs for different patients because they don't all behave the same way. And as I mentioned before, we have different biology, which include now the new immune checkpoint uh, inhibitors that are becoming to head and neck as well for the more advanced uh, disease combined with radiotherapy. And that's one of the focuses of the meeting I just mentioned uh, that I was at on the weekend. So the philosophy of using radiotherapy in this disease is really a trade-off in, uh, in the therapeutic ratio. Eradication of the primary and regional lymph node disease versus the potential for uh, quite extreme damage to normal tissue if you don't do it properly, which is the, ba the reason we're all at this meeting here over the next few days. Um, pharyngeal dysfunction, of course, is one of the great barriers to outcome, you know, good, to get good function uh, and achieve this goal of uh, organ preservation. Um, and, of course, we also would like to preserve other structures as well, particularly uh, bone from osteoradionecrosis risk, uh, xerostomia, and we also recognize that accumulating injury can happen if you combine these treatments. And I'm sure there's a slide that will be shown over and over again uh, from Dr. Trotty's work looking at the Thames outcome as the accumulating toxicity that happens with patients. I will not show that slide because I noticed that a lot of people tend to show that slide and I've left it out. So we do a look at the concept of overt disease, which is the gross tumor, and elective disease, where there could be microscopic um, disease that we know from patterns of behavior and the proximity of the region to the tumor uh, 
that there could be disease in those of those areas, and they don't necessarily require the same dose. In fact, we do try, try to tailor that, as I will mention in a moment. Sometimes there are areas that are at low risk, but maybe actually quite significant if a recurrence is to happen in those areas where there's no opportunity for salvage. So while the recurrence rate might be low, for example, a retropharyngeal lymph node in an oropharynx cancer, uh, you don't have any chance to salvage it if they fail. And, and so this is the kind of concept in terms of philosophy and decision making one has to go through. So looking at the types of radiotherapy doses we give, the, the, the classic concept of the elliptic do dose region was uh, uh, originated uh, where, where, where Steve, uh, Steve uh, uh, came from, where Gilbert Fletcher defined the idea of the elective area, the subclinical area that has more uh, has, has a degree of infestation that may be uh, uh, less than around the immediate part of the primary tumor. And a dose of 50 gray and 25 fractions or equivalent uh, should be able to eradicate it in at least 95% of cases. Uh, there are alternative fractionations now which have emerged in a quasi-empiric way. We didn't have any data. They're not really em empiric because there was no experience at all. Empiricism should have experience associated with it, even if there's no data. Uh, here we didn't have the data. We just, be, we just conveniently changed to doses like 56 gray in 30 to 35 fractions uh, or thereabouts when giving IMRT because that was a convenience. And that has been now in place probably for the last 10 years or so, uh, fueled by many of our clinical trials and so forth. And I think we've become comfortable with it, that it seems to be equivalent to 50 and 25, but we had no data when it was originally introduced. And that's the concept of the single phase IMRT plan whereas this was a 25 fraction plan going on to a consecutive boosting phase for the next uh, uh, areas that had needed the gross disease doses. And the gross disease doses should be in the order of about 70 gray and 35 fractions. Again, there are equivalent dose fractionations to that if you give higher dose per fraction or if you give more dose uh, over a more protracted period of time. But this would be the general standard for gross disease and elective doses to the potential microscopic disease, as I mentioned before. It's often intensified by different strategies, altered fractionation, concurrent chemoradiotherapy, or cetuximab, where we have one trial, the Bonner trial, uh, and does not really measure up in terms of the evidence that comes with the other two. Altered fractionation been shown in over six to, to 7,000 patients in a meta-analysis called the MARCH meta-analysis, which is a meta-analysis of altered fractionation in head and neck radiotherapy, uh, showing a 3.4% overall effect, but an 8% effect on overall survival if you increase the total dose uh, beyond what was norm what has given us a control arm in these trials. And similarly, the MAC-HNC meta-analysis with over 11,000 patients, a 5% overall effect of chemotherapy, but 8% if you deliver concurrent chemoradiotherapy. And these were both uh, done by the same group of authors, They're published in the same journals, the, the Lancet, both of them. Uh, and uh, it's interesting that this here became the standard uh, for all patients with head and neck cancer, and this year has almost been forgotten. And I, I guess that's understandable at one, at one level, but the problem about this concept of giving every patient with stage 3 and stage 4 disease this approach has now been challenged because we know they don't all behave the same way. And that's going to come out in the rest of this talk and probably by other speakers as well. And as a caveat also is that the neck is not properly controlled in the MARSH meta-analysis and in all the randomized trials of altered fractionation compared to chem concurrent chemoradiotherapy. So if you don't respond well in the neck based on imaging, and that's a whole other story about what kind of imaging you should do after the treatment, you may have to uh, be a little bit more aggressive in adding in a neck dissection. Um, that's uh, a little controversial. Part of the problem, I think, was because imaging was not very good at the time of those randomized trials and the techniques for delivering radiotherapy with a lot of junctions, a lot of different uh, aspects to how we delivered it in terms of using electrons off cord, all this sort of stuff, did not necessarily treat the target the same way as IMRT does today. So perhaps one could probably revisit that a little bit differently, but the trials are unlikely to get done to be able to show that uh, evidence anymore. Uh, and going back to this idea of the full uh, uh, course treatment with, a, with IMRT using a simultaneous integrated boost where you have differential doses within the area uh, and you can give the, these different doses. We ended up with those 56 grays and 33 or 35 fractions. Uh, these are, are now being challenged even more with a number of papers coming out showing even smaller dose per fraction and lower doses. For example, 50 gray at just over 1.4 gray per fraction being seemingly able to control the low-risk neck 
which uh, uh, is something that probably should be considered, uh, hopefully in prospective trials, uh, to look at it uh, more, uh, more carefully than uh, just in the empiric way I've described already. Let's talk a little bit about post-operative radiotherapy because that probably is not going to get discussed very much in these, uh, these, these, these couple of days. So there are adverse features like a T3 or T4 and where the resection margin is less than 5 millimeters and where it's close. Um, and we normally give chemotherapy along with the radiotherapy if the resection margins are actually positive. Uh, there are also relative indications of lymphovascular invasion or perineural invasion. In the neck, we also have some features that are important, especially multiplicity of nodes, but most of all, extracapsular extension, which is probably one of the more adverse features we see in our patients, and these patients uh, would have chemotherapy added to the radiotherapy. Um, and if our surgeons tell us that they were peeling things off, even if the margins are called clear, we don't like that. The surgeons don't like that, and we would ordinarily use that as indication to treat. Additional considerations also, and this is probably something that is not normally talked about very much in the tumor board, please get post-operative imaging before you give your radiotherapy. It's necessary to guide the adjuvant treatment. Um, you, may, you may see regrowth happening before you get started. You see that little node in there that's getting bigger, that wasn't taken out. Um, you don't want to see an overt disease still there that, uh, that has not been resected because that will require the 70 gray type dose. And we will often have to tailor the doses in a way to give 70 gray to a small area and then the more traditional post-operative doses to the main area and elective doses even. So you could end up with three or four even uh, dose levels if you find this kind of uh, situation. And this is all based in terms of the concepts here on two New England Journal of Medicine publications from the RTOG and the EORTC published back-to-back -back, uh, one uh, issue of the uh, uh, New England Journal uh, some years ago. So what sort of uh, margin principles do we do, do we take into account in terms of designing margins? Well, we're all familiar with these concepts, um, uh, the GTV and the CTV uh, uh, and so forth, but it doesn't tell you how much width to, you should give in terms of the coverage of these areas uh, using the ICIU 5062 principles. And the planning target volume set up motion uncertainty. In this institution, anyway, we do not put planning target volumes on. That's put on by our planning team and our physicists and our radiation therapy planners. The, the physician sticks to putting the targets on that are the areas where the disease are, is, is or might be. Uh, in other words, the high-dose CTV and the more moderate elective CTVs and so forth. And we'll end up with uh, this kind of arrangement with primary disease getting 70 gray for gross tumor, 66 from the post-operative setting, depending on the margin status. If it's positive, we'll give 66. Uh, and we normally keep it reasonably close to the uh, where the primary used to be uh, or where it currently is, when we're, depending on whether it's adjuvant treatment or primary treatment. And then we get back to that 50 to 56 story that I told you about already, uh, depending on the fractionation, which we would call the elective CTV, and normally about a centimeter from the current tumor or the site of the original tumor and that has now been resected if it has if it's a post-operative setting. And similarly in the neck, 70 gray, we give five millimeters around gross disease or the original sites of gross disease based on the imaging reports that we have. And again, 60 to 66, depending on the situation in terms of risk uh, when we're in the post-operative phase. If the margins, sorry, if the if the patient has extra capsular extension, they get 66 gray or 60 gray uh, if, it's, uh, if they don't have that. Uh, and the elective doses, again, are uh, shown here, as I've described already. Now, if they're in the post-operative setting, we change things a little bit, because if they've had dissection, we give a somewhat higher dose. And I'll show the basis for why that is the case in a moment. And then the most low-risk area, uninvolved, undissected, will get doses in the order of 54 to 56. We normally give 56, but uh, 54 is very reasonable as well based on the data that we have available to us. When trying to make decisions about IMRT contouring, or in fact any kind of contouring for that matter, but I guess we all do IMRT now, and that's what we're talking about today. Gross disease, you look at your imaging, you look at your image fusion, uh, and in the post-operative setting, you talk to the surgeon. You find, try to find out as much as you can about where this tumor was and what the problems were. Contouring guidelines are available. We've, re we've revised the international consensus guidelines about a year and a half ago. Uh, Dr. Gregor and a number of us from all the different cooperative groups uh, put together a more expansive guideline delineation document for the neck. Uh, and there's, of course, still some inconsistency in what should be the high-dose CTV around the primary. Um, uh, 
because we really don't have any data on that. Uh, we tend to borrow from what we do in the neck, in fact, to, to do that. And, and the neck disease, the neck situation is not that uh, plentiful either in terms of data, but it does come from this one paper from the MD Anderson uh, published uh, some eight years ago or so, showing that a five millimeter margin uh, will take account of pretty much all the clonogenic density area around potential extra capsular extension around lymph nodes, and that's the basis for the five millimeters that we would use around neck disease. Um, there are also some interesting issues about what, what volume should be used post-induction and taking into account the scar, how much bolus should be used, if at all, and contaminated surgical bed. And these are a little bit empiric and you kind of wing it a little bit on these because they're not very well defined. And we don't like causing moist desquamation in the neck where we don't have to, especially if it's going to cause cosmetic problems afterwards, which it often can. Uh, and the elective volumes may also need to be compromised in some patients. The elderly, the poor performing patient, uh, in terms of status, poor performance status, may not be able to tolerate very large swaths of, treat, of areas being treated uh, on an indiscriminate way just because they might happen to have disease. You've got to come up with some better recipe for these patients. Um, elective volumes, however, might be reasonable targets if doing adaptive radiotherapy, for example because they're, they're elective targets, they're not gross disease, and as you adapt radiotherapy, especially uh, when patient is getting, uh, when there's shrinkage of disease or if they're losing weight and so forth, you may well be able to change the elective target, but you can't change the gross tumor target uh, without uh, some degree of concern. And here's the, uh, the paper from MD Anderson that I did mention, which uh, affects the postoperative design, especially for lymph nodes. Uh, I'm sure Stephen's quite familiar with this. Uh, there are very few papers like this in the literature, but it shows that, that out to five millimeters distance from the lymph node capsule is basically where you should stop seeing a uh, cumulative degree of uh, extra capsular extension. This is a very carefully done old-fashioned study, which I like a lot, and I like to show it a lot because it shows some real information that you can now use to exploit in, in terms of making de decisions about how much coverage you need beyond where lymph nodes are or where they used to be before they were removed. And we tend to extrapolate that a little bit to the primary as well, but we don't have similar data that's as good at least uh, for the primary. And I mentioned before that you may have to uh, adapt things a little bit in the elderly. Here's a patient, an older woman of 80 years of age who I had to plead to let me give her treatment uh, with a tonsil cancer coming to the midline, and I just treated the opposite neck to a very modest area in level two uh, to, to, to deliver the, uh, the elective dose. Uh, and I kept the other targets uh, small as well. I didn't treat very far down as a low neck either. Uh, and we controlled her disease. Um, so these are situations where you have to use common sense because you won't get these patients through treatment. Or if you do, they will suffer hardship for the rest of their life. These are not uh, very robust patients. And you have to be careful with them. So I'm also going to talk a little bit about some milestones in postoperative adjuvant radiotherapy with or without chemotherapy because I doubt if that's going to be talked about here at this session either. And a lot of people aren't as familiar with this uh, who might be attending the course. So radiotherapy uh, combined with surgery began uh, some 60 years ago appreciating this risk of recurrence following surgery alone, especially in oral cavity cancer and in other diseases like larynx cancer and so forth. Postoperative radiotherapy uh, is uh, uh, punctuated by, by a number of important trials. The RTOG ran RTOG 7303 back in 1987. Uh, it was a pre-op versus post-operative radiotherapy uh, trial, and higher doses post-operatively were deemed to be the superior approach, and has basically been the standard ever since. MD Anderson ran a randomized trial, published a classic paper, which basically is probably the most important trial that we have to go by in terms of the dose specification, uh, authored by Dr. Lester Peters, looking at uh, dose uh, modified according to risk stratification by pathologic features. Probably the first paper in the literature looking at risk stratification uh, according to features, and it was sub subsequently validated by a, a paper to, uh, that uh, was pu uh, published using a slightly different strategy, but by Dr. Kian Ang, our, our good friend and colleague, uh, who unfortunately has now passed away. And, and uh, th this trial here by Dr. Peters is, uh, I will show you actually some of the data from that in a second. There's also a, a, a trial from India, and I'm just speaking to one of my colleagues here. Uh, Srinivas from India to find out where Orissa is. It's on the east coast of India. And there's very few data looking at randomized data as to the justification for why we can give postoperative radiotherapy. This is a surgery alone versus surgery and postoperative radiotherapy trial. And then I've already mentioned these landmark trials 
uh, earlier from the RTOG and the URTC establishing the role of chemotherapy, but the evidence for the value of chemotherapy, in fact, seems to diminish with long-term follow-up. Uh, Dr. Cooper's original paper in the New England Journal it does not hold up for 10 years as published most recently in the Red Journal. And that's a worrying feature because we haven't changed our practice because of this update. Uh, well, maybe they would have done worse, I suppose, if we didn't get the chemo. I don't know. But the, the, the problem is, is that they are not, the, the curves are coincident now after 10 years, which is a worry because it didn't hold. Uh, and we're still exposing patients to this sort of, sort of toxicity that uh, we worry about. Here's the, there's the study from India, 140 buccal mucosal patients, stage 3 and stage 4. Uh, and you can see the three-year overall survival for surgery versus post-operative radiotherapy. Uh, it, uh, there's about a 10% difference. It's an underpowered study. It's not significant, uh, uh, although the, uh, the degrees free survival does show significance. So this is the only trial that we really have to go by. Uh, justifying it. But I think common sense tells us that this is a valuable treatment, uh, even if the trials are not available to us. And that's one of the problems that we do have, especially in traditional treatments of this type. Here's Dr. Peters's trial, a classic trial that I mentioned, which has basically governed and, and, and informed us about the need to have risk stratified radiotherapy. Now, there was no chemotherapy used in this trial. The trial was a randomization to RMA and RB for low risk disease, that would be the close margin type, not so bad, the nodes not so bad, versus higher risk, positive margin, extra capsular extension type situations. And uh, up till uh, uh, the first interim analysis, they had a dose of 52.2 per RMA in this trial. Uh, and that was abandoned based on uh, an un unacceptable number of failures, in, even in this low risk group. So they ended up, in fact, being able to compare the 52.2 versus these other dose schedules and came up with uh, a number of observations and recommendations. First of all, the undissected at-risk neck area can be safely treated with 54 gray. And the reason I say at-risk means it could have disease in it, but it was not dissected and there was no overt disease there. 54 gray at 1.8 seems to be adequate. Higher local failure uh, can happen if you drop the dose um, uh, compared to if you go up to the, the higher dose ranges that happened at this point uh, on, uh, in the, uh, the uh, original dose, uh, uh, sorry, the subsequent dose A arm. Um, extra capsular extension needs at least 63 gray. No, there's no apparent dose response above about 58 gray except for extra capsular extension. Now we tend to ignore that. We go higher. We go to 60 gray. Right? Because in the modern era, everything is bigger and better and stronger and more intense and we give chemo and all these sort of things. So there's a bit of a problem that this is the data, but we've all give more. Um, and of course, we cause toxicity. But at least this is the basis for the, for the decision making that we take. First risk stratified trial that we have to go by in this area. And there are clusters that uh, exist. For example, uh, a number of different features, more than two adverse features, you get an increasing risk. If you've got more than four features, even if they're all kind of just okay things, they still have a recurrence rate that's equivalent to extra capsular extension, which is the worst scenario of all. So there are uh, different types of situation that might guide you into giving more intensive treatment and not just the classic one of a positive margin or an extra capsular extension. And maybe some of these should even be considered for chemotherapy if you believe chemotherapy is useful if they uh, are having this kind of recurrence pattern. So looking at the overall management philosophy of a, of a patient who comes in, there are a variety of different issues about the disease, about the patient's condition, and about what resources and infrastructure you have available, and the goal of the treatment, whether it be cure versus palliation. You want to look at disease control versus function preservation. You want to look at the available options, looking at standards and alternatives. You go to the institutional tumor boards and protocols and so forth that we have and the expertise you have available to you and you hope you can come up with something that is useful for the individual patient. There are a variety of issues prior to making decisions, the treatment options, the radiotherapy volumes, the possibility of adapting to things during radiotherapy, and then monitoring outcome and having good data afterwards. And this is a slide given to me by Dr. Sophie Huang, who will talk about the anthology of outcomes tomorrow, who runs our database. Uh, and she created this uh, structure, and I just borrowed it because I think it's a nice overview of what we should be thinking about when we see a patient coming in for the first time. And radiotherapy for this disease is evolving. Previously, we took everything as being the same except for early stage versus advanced or surgical versus organ preservation, the post-op or the primary situation. Uh, now we recognize this heterogeneity. I mentioned a number of these before. 
the PD-1 and PD-1 uh, ligand expression uh, expressing tumors having a higher risk of recurrence. We're now borrowing the concepts from melanoma uh, and other diseases to be able to possibly combine those with chemotherapy in addition to radiotherapy in the highest risk situation. And we have a lot of other issues about human papillomavirus, hypoxia, Epstein-Barr virus, and, it's, uh, and the quantitation of that in the plasma. Uh, even stem cells may even become something that uh, is used in the future. Uh, and a whole lot of different nuances of treatment and different types of patients, some of whom, as I mentioned earlier, may not be able to tolerate treatment as you might want. And when we make these decisions and we talk about all these wonderful new things we're discovering, we shouldn't forget that we also have a few patients that we're almost never talking about anymore or haven't talked about yet. And they are going to be the challenge for the future, especially the older patient, uh, where you need to come up with this balance that I mentioned earlier. And the HPV negative patient uh, needs uh, any, uh, strategies to improve their local control and their distant metastasis rates. I'm just going to talk very briefly about uh, this recently uh, star, uh, launched trial uh, that's uh, being run from the RTOG, now the NRG, in nasopharynx cancer, looking at whether or not Epstein-Barr virus is expressed or can be quantitated after they finish the definitive treatment. Uh, and a, this is a, an elegant trial uh, that uses a harmonized uh, approach to the laboratory assessment of EB viral copy number in the blood uh, with a randomization it, depending on whether it's negative uh, going to the traditional treatment, uh, uh, cisplatinum 5-FU as an adjuvant afterwards, or uh, observing them in, in a phase three uh, format, which will accrue about 600 patients. Uh, and in the lesser, less common situation, patients who have still uh, Epstein-Barr virus in their plasma will be randomized to the traditional uh, chemotherapy given at this point uh, versus a more intensive treatment with gemcitabine and patrotaxel. This will be a phase two component with about 100 patients. And this trial is currently running. It's a very elegant trial that uh, basically are being PI'd by Nancy Lee at Memorial Sloan Kettering, but a lot of the effort uh, has been uh, given by uh, Quinn Lee, who's the current uh, uh, chair of the NRG head and neck uh, group. So this is a, going to be an interesting trial. Again, a new concept in terms of looking at risk stratification uh, to choose patients who need treatments that otherwise uh, they would not necessarily uh, require. Um, and that decision has to come down as a randomized trial, I think, is the way to address this. And there, this strategy could be used for other diseases as well. It'll be the first time that we've looked at this. It's really like an extension on from Lester's original trial with the post-op setting. HPV deintensification is a huge problem at the present time. It's been fueled a lot by the fact that we know these patients do extremely well, but they don't all do so well. And there are as a profile which was established by the RTOG and, and, and Kian Ang on the 0129 study, looking at uh, a very good risk group with only a 7% failure rate or, 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 or survival pro, uh, deficit. Um, and these are overall survival and progression free survival for the HPV positive patients who are light smokers. Uh, but then there are intermediate risk patients that don't do as well. Um, and, and then there are high risk patients with HPV negative tumors. Uh, uh, who don't do well either. And you can see these, uh, these, these groupings or stratified groupings that you can see with the low risk, intermediate, and high risk. Uh, and one of the big concerns, of course, is would these excellent results that you're getting, for example, in this group, be recapitulated if you stop giving the intensified treatment? And that's guiding the entire approach to this group of patients at the present time. Uh, so, for example, we've looked at this, looking at a slightly different view of it, uh, considering the risk of distant metastasis uh, in the whole a group of uh, oropharynx cancers, and this is a uh, recursive partitioning analysis looking at HPV positive, HPV negative outcome for distant metastases, which they do pretty well, but you can bring it down through the N2, sorry, N0 to N2 group, and then on down into the T1s and T3s, and you can find this very favorable group, here it is here, with a 7% likelihood of getting distant metastases. Sounds not too bad, um, but if you look at this more carefully, and look at them up to N2A, uh, uh, there are patients who did not receive chemotherapy because they weren't able to tolerate it. They do extremely well, no matter whether they get chemotherapy or not. This actually is the chemo arm here, but they're, they're essentially the same. It's not any different statistically. If you look at the N2Bs, you're beginning to see a bit of a trend. It's actually significant on this. It's about a 10% difference between the two, 98 versus 89%. And N2Cs, 
And it's basically about a 20% difference between the two in terms of outcome if they didn't get chemotherapy. Now, this is retrospective data. There could be all sorts of reasons why it's happened. But nonetheless, it's happening the way you would expect it to happen. The disease is showing its form and, and character. And when you look at this even more carefully, this group here, according to smoking status, those who did not smoke or only light smokers have almost no risk of distant metastasis. And if you look at the heavier, packier smokers, uh, you're seeing a behavior that's not dissimilar to the N2C group. And now, because of these data, there's a, we, we've, we've looked at this kind of concept of some way of breaking this logjam on deintensification. There's one way that at least merits a different treatment strategy in terms of randomized trial approach. Uh, I call it the Rosetta Stone, or the unlock the key to unlock the mystery of how we're going to get through this, because we haven't been able to look at a good way of addressing this problem until now. But distant metastasis does come up as being a realistic problem, because it's the most common cause of death in HPV uh, or pharynx cancer compared to the traditional uh, local regional disease. So this can identify subsets of patients with dis different risks of distant metastases. Those who you might omit the chemotherapy who don't have the risk, versus ones who do need systemic modulation to their management, whether it be chemo and or other uh, 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 treatments. And I alluded to a few a moment ago with the PD-1 and PDL one l uh, checkpoint uh, uh, inhibitors that might be combined with cisplatinum. But whatever the issue is, we've got uh, two, two groups of patients that are split by looking at this kind of analysis. And this is now underpinning the design of clinical trials uh, in the uh, North American environment uh, to address uh, this particular important group of patients. The most uh, uh, obvious one being this very recently uh, launched trial from the RTOG, uh, now called the uh, NRG002. It's their second trial of NRG, as you, show the, you saw the first one a moment ago then, with nasopharynx cancer. Uh, this is being uh, led by Sue Yom and Maura Gillison. Uh, John is uh, our co-chair from, from Canada. And it looks at that exact group of favorable uh, patients, the oropharynx that I described a moment ago, who are not heavy smokers, and is a randomization to a more modest form of chemoradiotherapy versus a radiotherapy alone approach, even with a lower dose. Now, this is based on the data, in fact, from the Princess Margaret, 60 gray given over five weeks, uh, showing very high rates of control. And of course, it's a daring move. It's not a, not the traditional approach. This is a strong and controversial move to, to try and get de-escalation for a group of patients who have very few events in t at all, in fact. Now, another little interesting aspect is this here, a stratification to unilateral versus bilateral radiotherapy in tonsillar cancer that's lateralized. This is, again, a new concept in a, tr in a clinical trial. It hasn't been done before. And uh, you notice these little pictures that have just uh, emerged here when I did that. Now, I'll just comment on that in, in a second. But the this, this idea of unilateral radiotherapy versus bilateral it was, was quite interesting because some people, when we were designing the trial, were absolutely adamant they would not support this trial unless this concept was in there. And they're quite well-known radiation oncologists in North America. They said they will not support the trial. They won't put patients on unless there's allowance for this. So this is an interesting change that's happened because way back we wrote this paper, now almost 15 years ago since we did this study, showing that contralateral neck failure, failure is almost never seen when you give unilateral radiotherapy, if you choose them properly according to the degree of medial extension that happens. And here's an old uh, technique. You probably find a mask like this down the corridor down there in that little museum thing, and you'll all laugh at it, but this is the job, right? It treats the unilateral radio uh, neck and primary, although, again, we call it the, we, there are some pitfalls according to this. And I'll, sh I'll, I'll comment on this in a second, uh, recognizing the fact that you, you do need to cover the primary properly. And so you see uh, coverage of less than a centimeter or more than a centimeter here over the years and became less uh, in the latter part of the study. This is retrospective, so nobody was controlling what was happening. This is basically individual doctors doing their own thing. And you can see that if you had less than a centimeter of coverage uh, on the primary, you had a control rate which was disastrous, down to 30% local control compared to almost uh, uh, all patients if you had adequate coverage. So that goes uh, obviously uh, without saying that that's an important issue and it actually changed our management here at Princess Margaret for all our patients with head and neck cancer. Uh, th just the, the, the move to this particular um, uh, lower incidence of this 
poor control of the disease, in fact, coincided with the introduction of written policies, which we had introduced in the late 1980s, and basically described what you should do to get uh, coverage of the primary. Uh, and it required, in fact, a, a, a two centimeter clinical target volume coverage on the primary in the way we used to plan at that time. And we also forbade the use after that of, of planning these patients without planning CT. It's changed medically. We were just getting CT simulation at the time. So it changed a lot of what we did based on this, not just the de defining the poor, the, the, the low risk of contralateral failure, but also the way we should plan the primary. And introduced the concept of the, the QA rounds, which happen in this room every Monday morning, once a week. We have them here. Uh, it's real-time audit on the cases that are presented, and the cases are uh, very clinical. The imaging's looked at. We look at the contours as are relevant. And we need these because we do make mistakes. You, everybody can make a mistake, and we try not to have an aggressive approach to this. We all want to treat these patients successfully. Uh, and it becomes more of an issue as treatment complexity increases, and we have the risk of uh, not controlling disease. And uh, this is, of course, borne out very much in this more recent paper by Lester Peters that we uh, put a lot of patients on in the trial, and we performed the QA process. And there were only 850 patients on this trial who all had real-time QA and then after treatment QA as well. And it was a huge effort to try and get this done. And we had to call in the, the, the cavalry here from Princess Margaret to try and get part of this QA done because we were the closest center to where TJ Fitzgerald works at Providence, uh, Rhode Island, for the Quark uh, program. And so uh, Drs. Cummings, Kim, and Waldron also uh, joined me because we're the four closest to the center to complete the QA uh, on these patients uh, because others had to come from Australia and Europe and so forth. But you can see the effect of poor coverage, protocol violation uh, on local regional control, 24% impact that converts into a 20% survival advantage if, uh, or disadvantage if you don't accomplish that. It's nothing to do with the, any chemotherapy or anything. This is just bad radiotherapy you're going to get results like this. So you really do have to be vigilant about this. And if you've got patients, centers accruing a lot of patients, you can end up uh, with uh, a very different outcome to patients, to centers that are not familiar with the, this approach. So again, highlights why we're all here listening to these courses uh, these uh, last few days. Um, now, there's been a change also in OPC that we're all going to have to deal with. So classically, we give concurrent chemo radiotherapy. Now we're going to have to face the interesting experience of transoral robotic surgery or, or, uh, or, uh, or, or laser excisions at the primary site uh, transorally as well. And there are a number of trials that are emerging in this uh, way, which I'll show in a second. But they, are, they, they, do, they do cause a problem for us because we do have to have some reason uh, uh, and rationale for why uh, we're going to give or if we're going to give any adjuvant treatment subsequently because uh, the idea is to de-escalate their treatment and for a very small tumor with very little risk of lymph node involvement that sounds very good but for patients with bigger tumors and overt disease especially extra capsular extension it's not so good so uh, and I'll explain why in a second so here's here are two trials one from the uh, from ECOG and the other from the RTOG uh, one is for HPV positive and the other for uh, HPV negative. The stratification, the, the treatment approach here is to do TORS uh, on every P16 patient with limited disease. Uh, they're small volume, T1 to 2 up to N2B. Uh, and depending on what is found pathologically, they go into a low risk category, intermediate risk or high risk. And within the intermediate risk, they get randomized to 60 gray or 50 gray. Uh, and no chemotherapy. And these ones here are observed, which is nice for those patients. But these ones here get concurrent chemoradiotherapy. So they've ended up now having three modalities of treatment uh, for an early ish uh, oropharynx cancer. And in the HPV negative group, uh, you could basically take this particular algorithm without the randomization, that whole part, that entire bit is is randomized against concurrent chemoradiotherapy. So this is a higher risk group, HPV uh, negative. Uh, again, uh, uh, early disease, uh, and uh, th these two trials are currently ongoing and accruing, although the accrual is not good for this one so far, and probably because centers that have TORS aren't necessarily seeing a lot of HPV-negative patients who tend to be uh, in centers that are uh, maybe uh, have more smokers and alcohol uh, abusing patients who have this traditional form of the disease. Mm -hmm. There's also a Canadian trial that does not differentiate the two but basically does the same 
approach that we saw on the Holsinger trial for HPV negative radiotherapy and chemo versus transoral uh, with a risk based uh, uh, approach, exactly the same risk based approach. And you can see the different strategies for those three trials, all very similar. What is, different, what is interesting is these two have been harmonized to have the same resection margin status to decide whether you're going to survey them or not. They've made the effort to try and make them the same. At uh, more than three millimeters being, uh, or equal to three millimeters being the criterion for being able to survey a patient and not give them radiotherapy. The, there's, some, there's some little differences in the intermediate risk category, but the high risk is, uh, again, for all three established by positive margins, extra capsular extension, and uh, bad things that need concurrent chemo radiotherapy as we would normally do it. And again, remember, these patients are relatively early disease, and the ones down here are going to get all three treatments. And in fact, a lot of patients are found to have lymph node involvement, and they need more than just the TORS. The, 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 the group that get TORS actually are the smaller uh, of the, uh, uh, the smaller proportion of these. And there are a number of uncertainties, of course, because the appropriateness of this risk stratification is based on very limited data. The definition of the resection margin uh, is also very poorly worked out now. There's some retrospective series. Uh, we don't know, we don't have a, a robust long experience to know if this safely can follow these patients without radiotherapy. Uh, a little comment on the evidence for using IMRT. So we uh, put this uh, practice guideline into the ministry to get IMRT funding for all patients in this province and established that xerostomia and quality of life are clearly just determined in randomized trials uh, as, as being improved. Blindness and osteoarthritis should really be very uncommon with properly delivered IMRT and there's now an overall survival advantage in one trial, a big robust trial from Wuhan in, in, in central China, looking at 616 patients accrued over a five-year period, all stages, five-year outcome showing a survival advantage and with significant uh, impact on a number of important morbidity issues that include hearing and xerostomia. So this is a level one evidence for the use of IMRT in nasopharynx cancer that is uh, as good as anything that would, might come from, from, from other sources. Uh, a final little issue is why do we fractionate radiotherapy? We fractionate radiotherapy, and I put this in because it doesn't get emphasized anymore. We want to go on into stereotactic and we give big doses, uh, modest amounts of volume, and we think we've done a good job, and it's fine if the volume is small, but we have to be worried about the normal tissues when we do this. And, and also, concurrent chemo radiotherapy has basically covered over all what we all the issues we know we've traditionally known about fractionation and it doesn't get discussed very much anymore. But just to remind you of the four R's repair, reoxygenation, redistribution, and repopulation. Repopulation is potentially something that we have accelerated fractionation to combat. Uh, and repair basically with fractionation and of course hyperfractionation with small dose per fraction protects against late tissue damage. And you might say, well what's the evidence for that? Well I'm going to show you some evidence in a moment. Uh, so late responding normal tissues have a lower alpha beta ratio, typically around three or less compared to tumor, which is around 10. And we use smaller dose per fractions to reduce late toxicity. And this is a trial that uh, got us into the MARSH meta-analysis, the five-year results of a randomized trial. We looked at the uh, smaller dose per fraction, augmenting the total dose, and showed no increase in late toxicity. But we did get an increase in local control of over 10% and we had an improvement in survival. And this improvement in survival, while it's, it doesn't, hasn't maintained as the years go by, it's the longest follow-up trial in the Marshmint analysis, it's significant still. Um, the local control has maintained out over 15 years uh, with a 10% uh, effect and no, imp no deterioration in late tissue effect uh, despite an improvement in control by pushing the dose. So the fractionation has protected late tissues against damage. Um, uh, there are also other issues that happen in long-term follow-up that we, we need to be aware of. Uh, in particular, the fact that patients do get other, more, other causes of mortality other than their cancer, and we may misinterpret non-cancer death as treatment effect, which is important because progression-free survival is often used as an endpoint in trials, and, and this may uh, actually be a problem for even the HPV-positive patients because many of them are, in fact, smokers. So as we move into the future, we need to try and get the balance right in optimizing the therapeutic ratio. Uh, we're trying to take pressure off in terms of the intensive treatment, maintain our local control, however, 
but we, we do worry about whether we can do that safely, so clinical trials need to be done. So consistent application of radiotherapy and surgery with emphasis on quality remains an essential part of the management of head and neck cancer. There are present and evolving systemic agents to facilitate treatments, but there are costs and they're toxic. Toxicity is, continues to be our greatest barrier, our greatest enemy in this whole area because of problems with pharyngeal function and so forth, even in the IMRT image guided area uh, era. The fundamental principles of head and neck cancer management must be remembered. Um, if, even for the new targeting approaches and individualized treatment, don't forget what needs to be treated. Don't forget fractionation, the adequate dose, combining it with other treatments, and so forth. Clinical trials and evidence are the vital underpinning of all these decisions, and we should continue to work in a multidisciplinary way. So thank you very much for your attention.